All right, yeah. So thank you very much and thanks for the opportunity to uh, presenting my research here today. So um, yeah, we're going to make a little excursion now to more northern more um, um, areas of the planet, so in the Arctic, where there is um, permafrost. So um, yeah, you can see in the background here the type of landscape we are interested in. So it's a typical lowland tundra region. Here um, it's a picture of uh, the Lena River Delta in northern Siberia. That's uh, where we have field sites. And um, yeah, you can see this uh, polygonal patterned ground here. Um, this is a very typical feature, landform there. And um, yeah, I'm going to talk a bit about this and how this system responds to. Okay. Yes. Ah. <laughs> Should we start over again? No. Uh, <laughs> Um, okay, yeah, so this is the kind of system we're interested in. And um, yeah, just a brief intro to permafrost because not everyone might be so familiar with that. So permafrost just refers to state of the ground that it's um, below zero degrees Celsius for at least two consecutive years. And this condition is found uh, in about a quarter of the Northern Hemisphere's land area. Um, there are huge amounts of um, carbon stored in these areas, about uh, twice as much as contained in the uh, entire atmosphere. And there's also a lot of critical infrastructure in this region. So it's a big question uh, how permafrost thaws and how this is going to change in the context of uh, climate warming. Um, yeah, so um, one key complexity in this system, which is, uh, I would argue, often neglected, is the presence of excess ground ice. And it's also why my title is called uh, Ice Rich Permafrost Landscapes. So that means um, that there are deposits where there's so much ice in the ground that it's, its volume exceeds um, the core volume of the soils. And when this uh, ground thaws or this ice melts, uh, then it uh, leads to a collapse of these landscapes. Uh, yeah, because the ice was kind of. Uh, consolidating the grid. And it leads to the formation of different kind of landforms. So uh, we have formation of thaw lakes. Uh, it can lead in better drained areas to formation of gullies or thermal erosional valleys. Um, we observe thaw slums in regions where there's a lot of uh, buried glacier ice and also um, degradation of these ice wedge polygons, which I showed in the beginning. And um, yeah, all these uh, processes are quite um, local and um, rapid and so and often neglected in like large scale model assessments uh, of permafrost models. And so uh, I will try to present an approach in how to studying this and uh, I'll do this for this last case of these ice wedge polygons. All right, so um, at the top you saw these uh, typical polygonal patterns. They're typically water covered centers and um, elevated rims uh, between these polygons. Um, underneath the surface, um, there are huge ice wedges. So they form due to cracking of the ground in very cold winters. Then you get accumulation of snow in these cracks. And in the next uh, summer and winter, this will melt and refreeze again. And over hundreds of years, accumulate huge amounts of ice in the subsurface. So it leads to a very heterogeneous uh, distribution of ice on the subsurface. Now, if uh, this protective active layer, which is the part of the permafrost which thaws and freezes every year, uh, becomes deeper, it can lead uh, to melting of these ice wedges at the top. And what we then see are these uh, degradation features, uh, water impoundment in these troughs between the polygons and um, uh, subsidence of the rims because the ice in the ground is melting and the ground just subsides. If this continues further, it can lead to an yeah, inversion of the topography from these low center to high centered polygons. It often increases the drainage of the landscape and we have completely shifted energy and water balance of these landscapes. And it's also very relevant for decomposition of carbon in these soils. Uh, so the first objective here was uh, to set up a model which is able to uh, simulate this transition of these uh, polygons. Um, then we, yeah, we do that for our field site in the Lena River Delta in northern Siberia. 
Um, we have a very long data record here for about 20 years to evaluate our models. And um, yeah, if we look at this uh, island, so it's about two kilometers in diameter, we see that in different parts of the landscapes, actually the polygons look quite different. We have like these undegraded low centered polygons in many parts. Uh, we see some degradation features in other parts, um, quite advanced degradation and drainage of the landscape in some parts and also strong degradation, but with more uh, waterlogged conditions and water filled troughs uh, in some areas. And so um, even though this is all subject to the identical climate, um, so the next, uh, the second objective was to investigate a bit the hypothesis of how and how far uh, local hydrological conditions uh, control this um, um, yeah, evolution of these landscape uh, of these ice wedge polygons. Um, to do this, we um, used uh, what we call a tiling approach. So instead of really doing a 3D modeling of these polygons, we split the landscape into units. We just looked at polygon centers, polygon rims, and the troughs in between. Uh, did some idealized assumptions on the geometry of this system, and then integrated these different parts into yeah what we call tiles, which represent uh, all the polygon centers, rims, and troughs in a certain uh, area of the landscape. Um, and now with each of these tiles, we would um, associate an instance of a permafrost model, which is a vertical 1D model. It uh, takes into account the microtopography. So here we would have higher elevated rims, lower centers, and um, you know, some troughs. And what we have here uh, in this uh, white color indicated is actually a representation of these uh, very ice rich ground, these ice wedges. Um, so um, in this model, there is implemented an excess ice scheme. What it does as soon as the thawing uh, front goes into these ice rich layers, it will lead to subsidence of the ground and a change in microtopography. What we also uh, implemented is um, lateral processes between these landscape tiles, uh, so especially lateral transport of snow and water uh, according to the microtopography of the terrain is a very important factor. Um, and then in order to control these hydrologic conditions, which I mentioned, um, we connected these troughs, it's sort of a boundary condition to an external water reservoir uh, with which we can control the, the drainage. So if this has a low value, we would uh, take water out of the troughs, if it has a higher value, uh, it would lead to inundation of the system. Um, now I would just like to show two uh, yeah, example simulations for this system. Um, it's, so it's a 60 years run. Um, it's actually, it goes to 2040 here, but it's not a projection. It's just repeating uh, current day climate conditions. Um, and we have centers, rims, and troughs. Um, first case is for rather wet waterlogged conditions um, where we see these um, stable low centered polygons for about the uh, first decade of the um, simulation. So you see up here, uh, centers are water covered, water table is above the soil surface. Uh, the rims are rather dry with a uh, water table within the active layer. And um, down here are the troughs. And now after um, about 10 years, the, the uh, climate or the active layer uh, gets a bit deeper and now reaches actually into these ice rich um, sediment here, or it's almost pure ice actually, um, which is represented here in this white color. Um, and now it, yeah, these troughs start to subside and this process continues for uh, the next years. It's kind of feed it, uh, positive feedback loop uh, due to, because of this, um, yeah, ice from the ice wedges uh, is then in the active layer. It um, increases thermal conductivity. It um, increases ground heat fluxes, which leads to deeper active layers and so on. And so, yeah, this, uh, we have a subsidence here of about one meter or so, um, about a uh, period of 20 years. And concurrently also the rims of these polygons start to subside and get wetter and wetter. Um, after about these three decades, the um, rims actually subside below the level of the centers. And what we then see that the centers uh, 
suddenly run dry. So uh, that's exactly what I showed in the beginning. Uh, now we have much shallower active layers in the centers um, and yeah, wet conditions in the rims and the whole thing reaches a kind of new equilibrium state for this climate. Um, briefly, another case that's now for the drain conditions. Um, so it's all same, but for this uh, water reservoir level, uh, again, we have this low centered polygon phase in the beginning. Um, even though we drain water out of the troughs, uh, the centers stay water covered or wet because of the elevated rims, which are kind of in between. It's like a bathtub, you can imagine. Um, yeah, and it's, uh, this state is now stable for about three decades. And then there's uh, in the forcing data a particularly warm uh, year where uh, this degradation sets in. We have deeper active layers. And again, it's uh, fed by a positive feedback loop. Uh, we have uh, subsidence and degradation of these ground ice for the next two or three decades until the end of the simulation. Uh, the rims also start to subside a little. And what you can see that now the water tables everywhere drop considerably. And uh, the final state here is uh, entirely different regarding the initial state regarding uh, water coverage of the landscape and associated uh, energy fluxes. Okay, so um, yeah, if we now come back to our uh, study site, so uh, our simulations should be seen more as a proof of concept, I would say, but they also give some uh, or some supporting evidence for uh, the critical role of these local hydrologic conditions in this system and might uh, add some explanation to why we see for the identical climate uh, these quite different uh, types of polygons in such a yeah, um, small region. And um, yeah, that's uh, what I would like now to conclude. So first of all, I would like uh, you to maybe to remember that in these permafrost regions, we might have a lot of ground ice and that this leads to yeah, quite rapid and drastic changes in the landscape, um, which is not taken into account by uh, almost all large scale models, which try to project permafrost states in the future. Um, yeah, this tiling approach might be also a tool to um, bridge a bit the scaling and uh, possibility to uh, integrate these um, small scale processes into larger scale models. And finally, yeah. We showed here that this, uh, it's possible to simulate this transition of these uh, ice switch landscapes by coupling classical permafrost models, which just have the heat transport with um, yeah, schemes, which also take into account the dynamic uh, topography of the terrain. And with this, I would, oh, um, we uh, published this also in a paper. It has been uh, published about a month ago in the cryosphere. And uh, the code of our model is also available on GitHub if you're interested. Uh, you can also talk to me later. And yeah, that's it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jan. Yeah. Uh, we have time for a question or two. Um, so yeah, Jan, can you can you sort of summarize the question? Ah, okay. Uh, yeah. So the question was, if I got it right, uh, regarding uh, how these different hydrologic conditions, uh, uh, yeah, if they actually match with with what we see in the field, or uh, have... yeah. So uh, it's a quite shallow landscape, so you don't have large uh, gradients. It's really super flat. Um, so this is an island. So in this case, uh, it would typically be that at the margins of the island, uh, you would have um, better drainage uh, towards uh, the river, which is surrounding the island, and more in the central parts of the island, 
uh, yeah, you would uh, tend to have more waterlogged conditions. So that's a bit, yeah, there's a bit of correspondence, I would say. Uh, but in our model, it's, it's quite, I would yeah, um, constructed or artificial uh, boundary condition. There is not this uh, external water as a void. It's just a measure of prescribing different uh, uh, conditions there. Yeah. I think I saw another question here, Jaya. Um, of the entire permafrost area, I would say, I don't have a number, I must admit. Uh, in the cold continuous permafrost, um, which makes up maybe half of the permafrost region, um, it's quite dominant land landscape type in the in the lowlands. Um, what so it's spatially it might not be like the most dominant form, but um, there's a lot of carbon in this, especially these landscapes. So we have. Uh, deposits from the late Pleistocene that they're called Yedoma, and they have really a lot of carbon. Uh, they're spatially not so, like they're not everywhere, but it's very like localized um, yeah, deposits uh, where we have a lot of carbon and should really be sure uh, what's going to happen there. So. Thank you, Jan.